So hello, viewers. Welcome to the fourth virtual seminar on applied economics and policy analysis in Central Asia. Uh, I'm your moderator, Bahram Merkasimov. And today we're very privileged to have Professor Dr. Thomas Hersfeld uh, from IAMO. He is a director or head of the Department of Agriculture Policy at IAMO. He uh, is a professor at uh, the Martin Luther University in Halle, Germany, and his research areas focus on institutional change, corruption, microeconometric analysis of rural households and consumers, agriculture policy analysis, and so on. And he has been published in many leading uh, agriculture and development journals uh, in economics. So thank you, Professor Herzfeld, for joining us today. And we're privileged to have our own uh, discussant uh, to uh, give her comments at the end of the presentation, Etenesh Aswa. Uh, Etenesh is a senior research fellow at the Center for Policy Research and Outreach, which is based at Westminster International University in uh, Tashkent. Etenesh has a PhD in agriculture economics from the University of South Africa. Uh, she had uh, working experience at IFPRI and FAO, uh, based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So thank you, Etenesh, for doing this. Uh, so I just, I just like to remind our viewers, uh, if you have questions during the presentation itself, please use the chat option. And at the end of the presentation, when we open up for Q&A, please use the uh, Q&A option. So if we're ready, then over to you, Professor. Well, thank you, Bachom, for this friendly introduction. And I feel pleased and honored to be part of this seminar series. Though um, you might have seen over the last weeks news reports about potential restrictions on especially cereal markets, grain markets, and one headline from Reuters in April mentioned that Ukraine is planning to restrict wheat exports if export quotas will be um, overused or used up. In the European Union, we have a discussion about the new multi-annual financial framework regarding the EU budget for 2021 to 2027, and the common agricultural policy is a major element of this budget. And there are discussions that uh, for the future agricultural policy, there will be amounts between 346 billion of euros or 254 billion of euros and so forth. Um, and that's a hot topic of a political debate. And finally, a quote from Astana Times uh, from January this year, where in the speech, of the Prime Minister, there is this claim that uh, the Kazakh government spent more than 2.4 trillion tenger um, to the agriculture sector in order to promote agricultural production. However, the share of agriculture in Kazakhstan GDP is not exceeding 4.5%. My question to you is now, who can compare the monetary effects at farm level? Yeah, we have very different measures, very different amounts uh, in different currencies. And how can we make this comparable? How can we assess in which country or region agricultural policy provides more or less support to agricultural producers? That's the aim of, of my presentation today of the next 30 minutes, I would like to introduce you some approaches, some indicators which aim at measuring agricultural policy and expressing it in a way which allows a comparison across different countries and different economic regions. Let me, for the beginning, just wrap up what you might know already about different types of agricultural policy instruments. So you see on this slide uh, classified agricultural policy instruments in two large uh, groups. One group 
includes all instruments and measures which directly affect agricultural markets, which could be via border measures like the very classical tariffs or export taxes, import taxes or import quotas, which have a direct effect on the marketed quantity in a certain country and the respective prices, which will then develop in a certain economy. Next to border measures, we see a number of domestic measures, which again directly agricultural markets. In the European Union, we have had this classical example of intervention prices, which aimed at establishing a certain minimum price level on agricultural markets. Nowadays, we, the European Union switched from the intervention price system to a direct payment system. And some direct payments are still coupled, so they are still linked to produced quantities. Again, that prevent or provides a stimulus to produce a specific product and which then will increase, artificially increase, or by policy-driven increase, um, the supply on a market and will affect directly agriculture markets. And the th third example is the counter example, imposing quotas to restrict production of certain products. On the other hand, we have more indirect effects but produced by certain measures, which could be still distortionary or carry some distortionary elements. If you discuss about the decoupled direct payments in the European, European Union, they still provide an incentive to remain active as a farmer, to remain active in agricultural production. There are a number of studies which document spillover effects on land, market, uh, land markets and so forth. However, there might be also non-distortionary instruments, for instance, food safety laws, quality standards, which apply to all products which want to be or will be supplied on a certain market. And those measures mean at first position more to increase transparency on the market, improve the functioning of markets. So we have this range of very different instruments with very different effects on markets. And as economists, we are, of course, in the first instance, interested to know or which instruments are the most distortive, which instruments causes welfare, negative welfare effects. And the, in the beginning of this domain in the literature, the question was what is the, which, which border measures cause differences in prices. And one of the first authors were Timothy Josling in the 1970s and also Alberto Valdez in the early 70s, which started to compare domestic prices and world market prices and developed a sort of protection measure, very first simple protection measure, which is called the nominal protection coefficient, where you just divide the domestic price of a certain product, PI, over the world market price or reference price, PW. So this nominal protection coefficient will be larger one if the domestic price level is above the world market price level, which we interpret as a sort of protection of the domestic agricultural sector. And it will be below one if the opposite is true, if agriculture sector is taxed within the country. Just to illustrate this indicator, in this graph, you see the development of this nominal protection coefficient for the European Union, the blue line, and for Russia, this orange line. So in the 1980s, in the European Union, we still had a very high protection of the agriculture sector, though the EU grain prices or wheat prices in this example have been even sometimes twice world market price level. In this situation, changed substantially in the second half of the 90s with the reduction of the intervention price during the McSherry reform and the reduction of tariff rates for wheat uh, 
on, uh, on behalf of the European Union. Nowadays, in recent decades, the European wheat price is more or less close to the world market price. On the other hand, we see the example of Russia, which during the 90s tended to tax agricultural production, though the domestic wheat price is below a reference price. And this continues even in, in more recent years. So let's look at two different sectors. Uh, we have grain product production, and we assume there's a tariff rate of 10%, which results in a nominal protection coefficient of 1.1. But on the other hand, we have poultry production. Again, tariff rate is the same level, 10%. The nominal protection coefficient is similarly 1.1. However, do we really have the same economic effect of this tariff rate at the level of the individual producer of the farmer? And that's not the case. Yeah, if we assume that in poultry production, farmers use grain, the input costs to produce poultry will be higher under the existence of this tariff rate compared to a situation, reference situation without any tariff protection of grain markets. Therefore, we have to differentiate between the so-called nominal protection and an effective protection. The effective protection aims at comparing the value added. So it aims at subtracting any input costs which might be higher under domestic production conditions and just look at the net effect, so to say, uh, net of the uh, prices at the input markets and the output markets under different uh, uh, situations. And here we just um, illustrate this example, should illustrate um, the value added at domestic prices, PI, and domestic input prices, WI, and w, uh, VAW represents the value added at world market price level with world market output prices and world market input prices. And if you convert this into uh, using the example of an Advalorum tariff protection, we can finally find that both measures, the effective protection coefficient and the nominal protection coefficient, will be equal in cases the tariffs at the output market and the in all input markets will be identical, which might be an extreme, extremely rare case or in cases where there are no inputs. Yeah, in cases there might be any hypothetical production without using any inputs, then these effective and nominal protection will be equal. But in most cases, we have a difference. Effective protection will be most often lower than nominal protection. However, as I mentioned in the beginning, there is not only a border protection for agricultural markets and or the role of border protection even diminished in, in importance. Nowadays, many governments use direct payments for, to producers. Therefore, we also need to take into account budgetary payments which are directed to individual producers. And here I would like to mention one approach by Rednak, Volk, and Erjavets, um, agriculture economists originating from Slovenia. They suggest a so called agri policy measure tool, APM tool, which structures um, the market and direct producer support measures into one box of measures the structural and rural development measures, and a third group which represents all measures which benefit all agricultural producers in general, but not individual producers. And finally, the OECD developed in the 1980s, mid 1980s, a total support estimate, which aims at combining all different uh, effects at the level of uh, agriculture sector 
and it consists of an estimate of the producer support, which is consisting of the market, market price support, so the difference between domestic prices and world market prices multiplied with the amount produced uh, of a specific uh, product or direct payments received by farmers minus all levies imposed on farmers. So taxes which are paid by agricultural producers should be of course subtracted from this uh, PSE estimate. And often you find this percentage PSE measure which expresses the monetary amount as a ratio of the um, produced or value of the domestic production. Uh, so that's the at the domestic prices, the value of production plus the direct payments. On the other hand, the OECD also calculates the so-called consumer subsidy equivalent, which measures the costs of the agricultural policy, which are carried by the, on the behalf of the consumers. And the third group, uh, again, summarizes all measures or government expenditures which do not benefit individual producers but should benefit the agriculture sector in general or which represent some sort of public goods. Though maybe we have a short break here after this quick rush through the theory uh, to allow some, some first questions. So, uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I do not see any questions right now. So if there are any burning questions, please use the chat box to ask uh, on the theory part. So we'll give you a few minutes. Otherwise, then we'll move to the empirical part. So one question is, Thomas, what's L in the formula? Which formula? <laughs> Sorry, which? The, the question is, what's L in the formula? L in this one? The, yes. These are levies imposed at the level of producers or uh, taxes, yeah? Okay, any other questions? So far? Uh, no questions, Thomas. Okay, so then let's... I continue and maybe after the illustration we see more, more questions coming up. Though I would like to present you two empirical illustrations, one coming from Kosovo. Uh, that's a study we conducted for FAO two years ago, though it's not the most recent figures anymore, I apologize for this, but the general mechanism should become, should become clear. And Kosovo is a, a very interesting case. I, I expect that you know that Kosovo gained independence from Serbia and Montenegro in the 1999. And uh, it is receiving a lot of international support uh, through international donors and also bilateral uh, governments uh, from, from Europe and, and US. And they seem to be in a very comparable luxury situation to spend a lot of money to agriculture. You can debate after this in the discussion whether that's uh, useful or not. However, compared to neighboring countries, Kosovo uses, uh, spends a lot of money compared to their, related to their GDP. And this graph illustrates or classified um, the different measures, whether these uh, payments going to producers are directly coupled at, at the output level, any input use, um, whether they require that producers uh, raise any animals, farm any area, and so forth. Or here above you find any other criteria which are not relevant for, for this case, for this example. 
can be gray box. The last one is this general service and support estimate. So these are expenditures for veterinary agencies and food safety inspection agencies. So these are more the public uh, good with payments. And over less than 10 years, so since 2008, the expenditures uh, were directed to agricultural producers. So if you look just at this uh, red, brownish, and orange part, yeah, uh, more than, yeah, increased by a factor of 10, more or less, yeah, roughly. Um, which implies, though, that uh, in 2016, more than 40 million euro were spent directly to agricultural producers. And most of the payments, or roughly half of the payments, uh, are related to input use, and the other half, a little bit more than half, is related to um, the production of certain certain products. If we calculate this producer support estimate as a percentage of the uh, revenues in agriculture, we observe that this ratio increased from less than 1% to 7%, so approximately 7% of the income in agriculture is coming from directly from government budget. Compared to the European Union, it's still quite low. Yeah? For the European Union, this measure is around uh, 17, 18, 20%. It varies from year to year. But compared to the neighboring Balkan states, it's, it's comparatively high. If we look at the same expenditures in a different, um, just a different classification, uh, though we have the same amounts, we have these general service support measures uh, on the top. These are roughly a little bit less than 10%. Then we have direct payments, which is roughly 50%, and rural development measures, again, roughly 40%. Um, and the green and the red part of this column, they flow directly to agricultural producers. And the direct payments are related to the uh, production of very different types of crops, of production of milk, production of eggs, a certain uh, poultry, type of poultry and the fourth. And the rural development measures are investment support mainly investment support for setting up uh, glass houses, uh, setting up uh, processing facilities or um, storage facilities at farm level. So in this example, we just analyzed the budgetary expenditures from the Ministry of Agriculture. Yeah, we assumed that Kosovo is a part of the Central European Free Trade Area, the SEFTA, um, has no tariffs or almost no tariffs on agricultural imports. And therefore, this market price support or this difference in prices, domestic prices and world market prices, does not play any significant role. However, if we want to analyze this market price support, yeah? if you want to see whether this difference in prices has an effect, um, I would like to illustrate this in the case of Moldova. Uh, we have to discuss two, uh, we have to make some, some more challenging uh, decisions. So as I mentioned, the next example comes from Moldova, which is a recent activity Again, for FAO, where we update some existing uh, policy descriptions and measures of agriculture policy support. And I would like to illustrate, uh, take an example from the wheat market. In, for wheat, on the wheat market, Moldova is a net exporter since several years, so it uh, exports much more wheat than it imports. And therefore, we have to think about which reference price could be relevant to compare the Moldovan domestic price with. 
And you might know these concepts of uh, FOP and SIF prices. So FOP means free on board, which means that we have a farm which produces some wheat and we measure the value of the produced wheat and sold wheat at the level, at the ship, so to say, yeah? at the, or at the truck which leaves uh, beyond uh, the border. The other concept is the so-called cost insurance rate or SIF prices, which are relevant for importing situations. Yeah, then we would measure the price at the, for instance, at the processor, at the mill, which receives the wheat from a farm and has been shipped um, via ship or lorry uh, to this mill across a certain border. Though usually SIF prices are always higher than FOP prices. Therefore, it doesn't make sense to compare in the net export situation SIF prices with domestic prices as you include already uh, the transportation costs, the international transportation costs, which should not disturb the comparison of prices. Yeah? The idea is to make prices as comparable as possible. So, okay, first decision, Moldova is a net exporter, therefore we have to use the FOP price level. However, if we compare the Moldovan export price, yeah, this uh, FOP price is this blue line with other international wheat prices. So one example is the EU export price of wheat at uh, the Atlantic Sea, Rouen Harbor, and the Russian export price at this uh, purple line, uh, it's a Black Sea uh, export price, Black Sea uh, port. We see that all prices move more or less closely together, but they are still different from each other. And therefore, uh, we might get always different outcomes. So it's not that easy to say, okay, there is one single world market price as assumed in theory, there are different prices depending which position, which point uh, around the globe, the continent you measure this, uh, this price. So in this example, we took the, or previous authors already took um, the Moldovan export price, yeah, this blue line as the relevant uh, reference price and I followed this decision and in this graph you see the prices in dollar per ton and in this graph you see prices, so the PP is the domestic producer price, that's the farm gate price if you want in Moldova and RP, this red line is the reference price, this is this Moldovan for price of wheat. You see that both prices show differences. Yeah, if you compare the value for 2007, 8, 9, this price in Moldovan lay um, shows a much stronger decline than the price in US dollar. So that example illustrates already that there's another confounding effect which comes from exchange rates. So the Moldovan lay versus the US dollar appreciated uh, comparatively high in 2009, which caused the price in lay to decline compared to, or decline more than prices in, in dollar. However, though we can't change this yet, yeah, that these are the statistics we, we have. And if we based on these statistics, compare our two price series, we observe that the reference price or so the international wheat price is almost in almost all years above the domestic farm gate producer price. And the green dots represent this nominal protection coefficient, which is then shown at this uh, right hand side scale. And you see this nominal protection coefficient is always below one, except in 2018, though the last data point we have, it's close to one, or it's almost one. So based on this, on these statistics, on these data, we 
would conclude that Moldovan wheat producers are implicitly taxed. Yeah, they receive lower prices than they would receive under world market conditions. What exactly are the determinants of this implicit taxation? That's a matter of, of further analysis. Yeah, I can't tell you at the moment. There might be issues of, of lack of transportation um, capacities, infrastructure quality issues, and, and so forth. So there is no, as far as I know, there is no export tax which could completely explain this, this implicit taxation. So if we uh, then compare or calculate this uh, nominal protection uh, of wheat into a, a relative way, we could express it as a so-called producer single commodity transfer for wheat, which expresses this uh, value of um, wheat at the domestic or the difference in value between domestic prices and reference prices um, as a percent of the value of production. And this graph shows that in, in particular in 2009, uh, we observe that the value of production under domestic price conditions has been close to 60% lower than the value of production under world market price or under the reference price condition. So that you see that this amount is rather high, which is not yet yeah, from this NPC coefficient. Yeah, this ratio of 0.6 uh, is not that straightforward to interpret. However, if you know that's more than 60% of the value of produced wheat in Moldova, it's shows already a different um, number, but it's more tangible. So just. Okay, that's um, what is often used in, in policy analysis. Yeah, you know probably these regular publications by the OECD, and uh, which is quoted from, from different uh, also international organizations. However, even the OECD measure is not a perfect measure. Yeah, there are still issues which are not solved and which are still remain a challenge to compare across countries. Though there are a number of indirect ways of support which are really difficult to, to quantify, yeah, to measure their true effect on agriculture markets. It could be tax preferences, so lower value added taxes for food compared to standard value added taxes could be tax preferences for farmers, that farmers pay lower income tax or less income tax, or they have different rules to calculate profits compared to non-agricultural producers. In the European or in Germany, you have a preferential treatment in social security system, or also in Poland and other countries, that farmers pay less contributions to the social security system compared to workers in manufacturing sectors, for instance, that is also an indirect subsidy of agricultural activities. However, again, that's very, very difficult to, to, to quantify and the effect on agriculture markets is very difficult to trace. And the second point, which is also very difficult and very challenging uh, to, to quantify are feedback effects. So, Let's imagine a very um, a country which heavily depends on uh, agricultural exports, for instance, any price changes on for agricultural products will directly affect exchange rates and change of exchange rates will then affect again price ratio between domestic and international prices. So you have sort of feedback loop uh, via exchange rates, which is also difficult to disentangle. Yeah? You observe a gross effect at the end uh, in, in price differences. Similarly, if you have uh, effects on relative factor prices, so wages or labor costs versus capital costs, um, which could be caused by 
shocks on agricultural markets or shocks uh, on labor markets, like under the current situation. Um, and then the trigger feedback effects in the agriculture sector, which are very difficult to quantify. However, let's sum up. Um, though we know the literature um, shows us, gives us a number of approaches to quantify agricultural policy support in a consistent way and comparable way across different countries and different regions. And it depends on your research objective, which approach is the most appropriate, yeah? whether you are more interested in market price effects, market price differences, or you are more interested in production incentives, whether measures are coupled or decoupled, or other, other research questions. Unfortunately, more comprehensive measures like the OECD measures um, are more data demanding. Though you need some government finance statistics, you need um, statistics about prices at different stages. Ideally, you have data about handling costs, mar mar marketing margins, and so forth, which are in many situations quite difficult to obtain. And unfortunately, or for us, it's, it's, it's good, yeah? <laughs> the coverage of Central Asia and Caucasus countries so far in OECD uh, statistics and also in the in World Bank project, Distortions to Agriculture, is very limited. So there's just Kazakhstan, Russia, Ukraine as big agricultural exporters, um, but then more or less no data for Uzbekistan, for instance. Therefore, there are tasks waiting for agriculture economists to produce some first estimates of um, agricultural support in, in Uzbekistan. Yeah, with, who is interested in reading more about the background and construction of indicators, I recommend to have a look at the papers by Kim Anderson, which started, who started a long-term project measuring distortions to agricultural incentives um, in 2000 seven, six, seven, something like this. So 2008, they published um, a research working paper where they described their method and approach. And this data set has been updated continuously. And you can find this data set under this link. Unfortunately, again, there's low coverage of CIS countries. Very classical source, of course, uh, the OECD, which covers all OECD countries plus major agricultural uh, producers in the world and um, the study I mentioned or number of studies has been produced by Tina Falk and co-authors for the European Commission and they produced a time series of agricultural policy support for West Balkan states so former Yugoslavia plus Albania which is also quite useful to, to read to have a look at. With this I Thank you for your interest and I'm looking forward to your questions and to be discussing them. Okay, thank you, Professor. Um, so while, before I give the virtual floor to Etanesh, <laughs> uh, please, uh, you can send in your questions uh, after our discussion finished with your comments, then I will read qu your questions one by one. Uh, so in the meantime, over to you, Tanesh, please. You have five to eight minutes. Thank you, Bakro. Uh, I feel uh, privileged to be your discussant, uh, Prof. Um, I will uh, reflect on uh, three points. One is uh, on agricultural policies and the importance of measuring agricultural policies. Uh, the second reflection will be on the tools uh, that are used to quantitatively measure uh, the impact of agricultural policies. And uh, last, I will reflect on um, what is happening in Uzbekistan and the reforms and policies and um, how to actually measure it. Um, so to the first reflection, why um, do we measure uh, policies? Uh, is 
because policies are meant to be like tools for the government and governments always have uh, intentions, good intentions. And as Prof was talking about uh, tariffs, subsidies, direct investment uh, to farmers, all those uh, instruments are meant to uh, support the country to increase production and productivity, food security, and improve the well-being of producers and consumers. So all policies uh, are supposed to have a positive uh, impact in the country and are well intended. But uh, what Prof was trying to tell us is that uh, not all policies have the same impact and uh, policies are very contextualized, so what works in Moldova and uh, Kosovo might not work in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. What works in Europe and USA uh, does not necessarily uh, have the same effect in other countries, so that's why we need to uh, measure it. And he talks about um, quantitative, uh, quantitatively measuring it and monitorizing uh, the policy measures for the agriculture sector. And these examples he gave are very timely because uh, most countries are using tariffs and quotas to protect their countries during this COVID-19 crisis. So uh, measuring if uh, and checking whether these policy interventions are on the right track might be very important. And it's not isolated cases we're talking about. Uh, it's global. So each country uh, should take their own context in terms of measuring uh, their policies. Um, so this, uh, this takes me to the second reflection I have, and it's on the tools that a professor was talking about. He talked about two important uh, sets of tools. One is on the border uh, policies that um, try to control prices and market prices and tariffs, um, effective protection. Well, countries use these tariffs and quota systems, to pro as I said, to protect uh, their country um, and to protect the labor employment in the country, to protect the industry, which is producing in that um, country. But uh, is it always uh, true that they are protecting their economy? And we see that economic theories tell us that uh, tariffs mm, are beneficial, but might also have um, costs. So it's very important to weigh the benefit and the cost of such uh, policies and uh, the implications of such policies. Uh, and he talked about uh, effective protection and nominal protection. Nominal protection uh, are easy to see, so uh, that's why countries commonly resort to tariffs and protecting their border, closing uh, and imposing these high uh, tariffs and duties on imported items uh, for various reasons. But there are hidden costs, and um, which he talked about value addition, and uh, there are tools uh, to measure it, which um, is very important. And um, uh, I mean, um, you, you can calculate it. And uh, as economists, we should be able to I think we lost her. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so Professor uh, Etanesh, are you online? Would you like to quickly respond to her comments, Professor? And then I'll ask, I'll read some questions from the audience. Yeah, generally, I, I fully agree with um, Professor As Asfa. Um, that uh, it sounds the protecting <laughs> sounds very <laughs> very positive yeah nurturing the agriculture sector however as economists uh, many many studies show that um, it has or tariffs for agricultural products um, 
harm producers, yeah, producers would, uh, sorry, consumers, consumers would be better off in the importing situation without tariffs. And also the example of the European Union shows that promoting agricultural production beyond artificially by, by using agricultural policy instruments causes high budgetary costs on the one hand and on the other hand um, distorts, could distort um, world markets, could harm producers in other countries and generally um, is not well for enhancing. And in order to, to uh, analyze, so this is these indicators and variables I wanted to present are uh, a tool to engage in more comparative studies to analyze the true effects of those measures for agricultural growth, for production, and so forth. Okay, so <clears throat> if we get to the, um, if you could respond um, uh, so as briefly, well, let's, let me read the questions first. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so the first question is from our IFPRI colleagues. So some Central Asian countries extensively use uh, coercive policy measures in the agriculture sector. How can we measure them? and their impact on farming outcomes. Is there any evidence in this regard? Yeah, that, so there are a number of colleagues within YAMO which try to, to develop measures for Central Asia. And uh, in particular, if we look at um, these compulsory production quotas, which have been in place or partly are still in place in some countries, I would expect that uh, those measures represent some sort of taxation of agriculture. Yeah? Often farmers, the farmers are produced, forced to produce certain products and they receive administrative prices and products will then be competitive at world markets. Um, there must be somewhere a tax wedge and uh, the idea or the plan is to come up with quantitative estimates um, in the next uh, yeah, month, hopefully, <laughs> yes. Um, so far, I'm, I'm not aware of any, uh, I, I, no, uh, definitely I would expect that there is a uh, negative evidence here yeah, that uh, you could, uh, if farmers have the free choice to decide, they would produce different crops than uh, crops which they have to produce. Okay, uh, next question are from your IAMO students. So yeah. from, from the graphs provided, we can see that direct payments could be a good instrument, policy instrument, uh, since it directly incentivizes large producers. But such policies are costly, especially for developing regions such as Central Asia, that also needs to finance undeveloped agribusiness environment and rural infrastructure. So how should these governments make trade off in policy making? Direct support to targeted producers or inclusive development of agribusiness environment across the country? Your thoughts? Yeah, that goes uh, in line with what I, what I stated before. Though any direct payment um, is basically benefiting individual producers, but not the, the sector as in general and not the development of the sector. So if you want to transfer money to some agro holdings, um, yeah, then use direct payments, but it's not a good policy instrument in, in the perspective here yeah, regarding the development of the sector in general. And therefore, we should always um, I argue that governments should invest more budgetary resources in training facilities, in extension services, in infrastructure, in particular in small in settings with small producers. I see in many countries the need to further develop um, collection, um, market information systems, and also processing facilities, which are in some cases still in a very monopolized structure inherited from the, from the socialist past. Okay, next question is uh, two, uh, two prongs. So 
how data is intensive is such analysis you've shown in your slides. And related this, farmers in Uzbekistan have been for many years taxed through the state production quota and low procurement price. Despite this tax on farmers, the wheat production in Uzbekistan was expanding. Uh, both wheat area and yields were growing. How to explain this paradox? Does it mean that farmers were provided with cheap fertilizer and missionary services? Your thoughts? Well, regarding the first question, um, indeed, it's um, data intensive. Uh, yeah, you need to have some transparent statistics and reliable statistics. That's a precondition for, for such analysis. And the more detailed you want to be, the more closer to, to, uh, to the real situation, uh, then, then you need more data. The, regarding the development in Uzbekistan, I have to admit that I am not fully aware of the, of the development, um, quantitative development in wheat yields. Um, I could imagine that, that the sheep fertilizer and, and electricity subsidies or machinery services um, are one important element in growing uh, productivity. Um, and it's also clear that if you would abolish those quotas that wheat production will decline uh, as, a, as a reaction. Yeah? Probably farmers will switch to vegetables and other uh, crops. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question is, in terms of farm level impacts of agriculture policy, besides revenue generation by producer, producers, what factors were also measured in Kosovo and Moldova cases? No, both studies just aimed at quantifying uh, the the policy support to farmers and then classifying policy support into different measures, looking whether it's coupled or not coupled and, um, and the fourth. Um, both projects did not aim at measuring whether farmers who received direct payments grew quicker or faster than others. That's uh, another step which was outside of the, of the scope of those studies. <clears throat> okay, and uh, another data related question. So where can they find these statistical data producer prices on agriculture production, wheat, milk uh, for, you know, for the European Union and India? Yeah, I can, I can only speak for the European Union. Uh, there I would recommend to look, uh, the, look up the website of the European Commission and they have, um, they have annual reports of the situation of the agricultural sector where you find annual data uh, producer prices for different products at uh, member state level. Uh, but there are also detailed statistics about prices at a monthly uh, interval. Uh, and the, the, the European Commission provides a number of statistics which is sometimes difficult to find, but if you invest some time in their websites, then, then you should be able to find them. Okay. Uh, another question is on from your slides. So you've shown that PMPC is below zero, uh, below uh, is uh, PM on your slide 13 is negative and below zero. Why is it negative? Because of higher taxes and lower subsidies for wheat? The, uh, the yeah, PSCT. The so producer single commodity transfer yeah. uh, is driven by this difference between the reference price, yeah, the Moldovan export price, and the um, no, sorry, yeah, the Moldovan export price and the domestic producer price at farm gate level. Um, though we are not aware of any direct payments for wheat in Moldova, there are no direct payments, no subsidies for wheat. And um, my uh, guess is that the difference is mainly caused by 
exchange rate adjustments, as we have seen in 2009, uh, and the uh, transportation, the state of the transportation infrastructure, uh, and maybe also uh, some, some monopsonistic power by, by traders, which then is reflected in this price, price difference. Mm. Okay. Uh, Etenes, would you like to, <laughs> you're back online. Uh, so we have a few minutes. If you would like to say something, then I'll close. Sure, sorry for the interruption. So I, I was uh, making my second reflection in the tools and uh, I was trying to say uh, the second tool that professor was talking about on uh, public expenditure and measuring the impact of uh, government expenditure in the agriculture sector. And there, as uh, you rightly said, data is very important. We need data on how much goes to the different uh, aspects um, for the agricultural production, uh, how much uh, transfer goes, to, um, of many goes to the producer, to the consumer, and for general service. We also need a price uh, reference, world price and domestic price for selected uh, commodities that we want to work on. And another point I want to reflect there is that uh, there are many tools, yes, that can quantify the effect, but um, the professor didn't talk about the, how to measure it uh, qualitatively also. So uh, measuring um, the effects of policies qualitatively is also very important using case studies and uh, most significant change in those um, countries where the policies have been implemented. This takes me to the third uh, reflection on Uzbekistan. Um, uh, Uzbekistan is a very a dynamic country where many reforms are taking place since 2017. And it's very important to uh, see the impact of these reforms at uh, producers' level. There was a public expenditure review then in 2019 uh, that tries to take stocks of um, what the government is spending for the different uh, aspects in the agriculture sector, including, including um, service, including direct payment and so on. And uh, that report says that Uzbekistan spends a lot of money in agriculture, which is like 1.8% of the GDP. Maybe it's not like Kosovo. Uh, but in, in terms of impact for the farmer's income, it's very low. So um, since 2019, there is a huge number of reform on where to uh, actually spend and less on uh, agriculture, um, I mean, um, spending on cotton and wheat and diversifying uh, expenditure. Um, but Again, we should have uh, availability of quality data. And there are current reforms happening in the agricultural statistics uh, at the statistics committee level, but also at the Ministry of Agriculture level in terms of collecting quality data for analysis purposes. And we hope uh, that this will help in future analysis of policies. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Atanesh. And thank you again to Professor uh, Thomas Herzfeld. And uh, it was a very interesting talk. So to our viewers, thank you. Uh, you can join us next Wednesday at the same time uh, to listen to Professor Shen Yan Fan. Uh, he's a professor at China Agriculture University, but also former Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute. We will upload the slides and uh, the video, as usual, on our website, conference.wiut.uz. Uh, you can listen or download everything under each speaker's um, uh, tab. So, uh, and these webinars, were, uh, I would like to thank our uh, organizers uh, who are jointly organizing this with us. Uh, so, Kamjan Khan from IFPRI and Nodrbek Janidekov from IAMO. With that, I would like to thank you again, uh, our speakers, Artem, who is helping with logistics, and our viewers. With, uh, and I'll close this, and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Westminster